storage strength in this framework, we assume is a pure accumulation process. Namely, any storage strength you build up from your past remains. Uh, it's a pretty strong assumption, but so far we, uh, in terms of trying to fit this framework to different uh, findings, we've, uh, that idea has been supported. So it would just say that when information gets entrenched, achieves a certain level of what we call storage strength, it remains there. Now, a key notion and it's almost a starting point for the theory, was this evidence that no matter how well learned something gets, some street address you had growing up for the first 18 years of your life, some combination lock number or phone number that was absolutely automatic and used hundreds of times, no matter how well learned it becomes in the storage drink sense, it will become inaccessible with a long enough period of disuse. You won't be able to recall this thing 15, 20 years later if there hasn't been any use or access. But you can easily see that it remains in memory any number of ways. Uh, you've forgotten this high school friend's name, you can't recall it, but if I show you four names, you'll pick it out immediately. Uh, and if there's any need to relearn that information, uh, that's greatly accelerated. So this starts to point to why this might be adaptive. Because we have so much information in our memories, we don't actually want everything to be accessible. So for example, uh, you would have a number of phone numbers from your past. And if I asked you your current phone number, it could work like some computer routines that, that you would come up with a list of all the phone numbers you've ever had and then go through some decision process as to which one's current. But instead with human memory, the ones you've stopped using become inaccessible. It means they also stop interfering with the, your memory of the current number. And so in all kinds of ways, we have to update, we have to remember where we left the car today, not yesterday, not a week ago. We have to remember what uh, a woman friend's current married name is, not what her maiden name is. Over and over again to be efficient, we have to update our memories and to have the current information be most accessible. And the way that appears to be accomplished in human memory is as we stop using it, the retrieval strength gradually decays. Uh, it remains there in the storage strength sense. It can be recognized often if it reoccurs. You see a name in the paper and say, hey, I went to high school with that guy. Uh, you have to relearn something makes you go back to somewhere, uh, maybe to your parents' old house or something, and you remember the street address. So it remains in memory to be relearned at a rapid rate to be resurrected, and the system really is, is quite sophisticated. Uh, without getting into too many details, one thing that it sort of does for us, even though we have these frustrations in using our memories, most of the time the information most relevant to right now in this situation is the information that we most need. And information in competition with that will tend to be more inaccessible. So in spite of all these frustrations we have that we, we know we know something but we can't recall it now, uh, in overall, in a statistical sense, the system works very well to sort of combine relatively rapid access with relatively good access from a probabilistic standpoint. So it's, a, it's, it's quite remarkable architecture overall and um, more and more we're tending to understand how the brain implements it. Uh, and there's a lot of excitement about that. That's not my own particular domain, but I'm a sort of consumer of that research. And so it's an exciting period in terms of how we're finding out about the, what, what I sometimes call the functional architecture, how the system works, and then how the brain implements that functional architecture.